Hello, welcome to an evidence-based approach to examining the vertiginous patient, a video produced in conjunction with the UC Davis School of Medicine. In this video, we'll give a quick overview of the evidence-based physical exam. We'll discuss an evidence-based approach to physical diagnosis and assessment of vertigo, with an emphasis on distinguishing between central and peripheral etiology. And we'll provide a video of a UC Davis Master of Clinical Educator demonstrating high-yield physical exam maneuvers that every UC Davis grad should know and the evidence behind them. Hand washing before and after each physical exam has been well studied and shown to reduce morbidity and mortality in the hospital and the clinical setting. We are all familiar with the basic components of a complete neurologic exam, including cranial nerves, strength and sensation, reflexes, cerebellar testing, and gait. And while these provide the foundation for our basic neurologic testing, this video is going to take a slightly different approach. An evidence-based approach to the physical exam begins with a diagnostic question. For example, does this person have chronic anemia? To answer the question, you first estimate a pretest probability which is essentially your best guess as to how likely you think this patient is to have the pathology in question based on aspects of their history, presenting symptoms, etc. It's generally expressed as a percentage. Using this as your starting point, you choose an evidence-based physical exam maneuver, which depending on whether the test is positive or negative, will feed back on your original hypothesis, giving you a new post-test probability, as demonstrated in this figure. For example, if you don't think that your patient is anemic, giving them a, a pretest probability of 20%, but then you discover conjunctival pallor on exam, that really changes your thinking, giving you a much higher post-test probability. How much a given physical exam maneuver changes your pretest probability depends on the sensitivity and specificity of the test, which in this case is expressed as a function called the likelihood ratio. You can see in the figure how a positive or negative likelihood ratio can affect your pretest probability either a great deal, for example if you have a positive likelihood ratio of 10 or more, or barely at all, for example a likelihood ratio close to 1. Let's see how this applies to the vertiginous patient. Before going any further, it's important to distinguish what we mean when we differentiate between peripheral causes of vertigo, which include processes that act on the peripheral nervous system, or the structures of the inner ear, from central causes of vertigo, which act on the cerebellum, or central nervous system. Here are some common causes of both peripheral and central etiologies for vertigo. We begin by estimating our pretest probability which is our initial guess as to the etiology of our patient's vertigo, based on patient demographic information, as well as their presenting symptoms, including provoking and palliating factors and associated symptoms such as hearing loss or vomiting or neurologic deficits. In this case in particular, history is of paramount importance. For example, one systematic review suggested that history alone was sufficient to make the correct diagnosis in up to 76% of patients presenting with vertigo. In another study, a combination of age less than 69 years old, the presence of vertigo, and no focal neurologic deficits ruled out dangerous causes of vertigo such as stroke, arrhythmia, medication adverse reaction, and seizure with a sensitivity of 87%. So how do you use this to estimate pretest probability? Well, to begin with, it helps to know the relative incidence of different causes of dizziness in the American population at large. This is a table from the largest meta-analysis done to date published in the American Journal of Medicine in 1999, breaking down the incidence of each common etiology of dizziness by percentage in the population. Notice here that about 50% of the patients who present with dizziness actually have vertigo as their cause, and only in about 1 in 5 of those patients have a central cause to their vertigo. In fact, peripheral vertigo is so much more common than central vertigo that a simple questionnaire asking about timing of symptoms and associated hearing loss was able to accurately diagnose patients with vertigo about 60% of the time in one small prospective study. So once we've estimated our pretest probability based on our knowledge of the relative incidence of different etiologies of vertigo in the community combined with aspects of our patient's history, 
It's time to use evidence-based physical diagnosis maneuvers to help sense the diagnosis. We'll start by discussing key exam maneuvers suggesting a central cause of vertigo, beginning with truncal ataxia at rest, or titubation, which has a positive likelihood ratio of 17.9. Here we see a patient demonstrating the so-called cerebellar gait, wide-based, staggering, and veering off towards the side of the lesion. And here we see him demonstrating resting truncal ataxia, so-called titubation. The next exam maneuver we'll discuss is psychotic pursuit, which has a very good negative predictive value with a negative likelihood ratio of 0.1. This exam maneuver is elicited when you ask the patient to follow your fingers with their eyes. As they do so, you'll see a psychotic pattern with their eyes essentially trying to catch up to your finger rather than a smooth motion. Note that the absence of psychotic pursuit, meaning that the patient is able to smoothly follow your finger with their eyes, suggests a peripheral cause of vertigo with a negative likelihood ratio of 0.1. Next, let's discuss skew deviation which, with a positive likelihood ratio of 8.5, strongly suggests a central cause to a patient's vertigo. Here we see what skew deviation looks like, with a slight hypertropia, or hypotropia, of the eyes when they're gazing head-on. So if you're examining a vertiginous patient and you notice this sort of uneven gaze, that should tip you off that there may be an underlying central cause. Here's UC Davis Master Clinical Educator, Dr. Mark Henderson, demonstrating the head impulse test. So we're going to check the oculocephalic reflex and the way we do that is we actually have the patient stare at our nose, straight at our, our um, nose, and then we're going to uh, instruct them to keep staring at our nose while we move their head to one side or the other. So in this case I'll go test the left side first. So I'm going to actually again have him stare at my nose and move his head quickly to the left. And what you can see is, in a case of peripheral vertigo, when I do this, I'm, again, I'm going to have him move his, I'm going to move his head to the left. His eyes remain fixed on me, which is consistent with normal or a central cause of vertigo. So in a patient who has a left-sided peripheral lesion, when I move his head to the left, what will happen is the eyes will be stuck there and then make a couple of saccadic corrections, if you will, to come back to normal. You'll see saccadic movements bringing the eyes back to the central plane. I'm going to test, here I'm going to be testing for a right-sided peripheral lesion. So I'm going to have the patient stare at my nose and instruct him that I'm going to move his head quickly to the right, like this. You can see, I'm going to do it one more time, I'm going to move his quite, head quickly to the right. In a patient with a right-sided peripheral lesion, you would see the eyes actually deviate to the right and then quickly correct with saccades. Now, if your pretest probability suggests a peripheral rather than a central etiology to your patient's vertigo, the dix hall pike maneuver is the most evidence-based test that you can do to support your hypothesis with a positive likelihood ratio of 7.6. You should note, however, that the negative likelihood ratio is only 0.6 meaning that if you have a negative dix hall pike maneuver, it does not necessarily rule out a peripheral cause for the patient's vertigo. Once again, we have Dr. Mark Henderson to demonstrate. We're examining here for is a patient with dizziness, a vertigo in particular, and trying to distinguish between peripheral and central causes of vertigo. So the dix hall pike maneuver is one in which we have to lower the patient quickly uh, to the supine position and then extend the neck and rotate the uh, patient's head in order to stimulate or reproduce the vertigo. So what we're looking for here is reproduction of symptoms and we're looking for nystagmus on the affected side. So we have to do this twice and what we do is we have the patient, so I'm going to do the right side first. So I have the patient look to, towards me at about a 45 degree angle and then I have the uh, neck extended by 20 to 30 degrees like this. And then what I'm going to do is get behind the patient so, and make sure you warn the patient that we're going to lower him quickly and that, that this might provoke some symptoms of nausea or dizziness. And basically in one quick movement we lower the patient and then hold their neck up like this and I'm now observing for nystagmus. I wait 20 to 30 seconds 
because sometimes it takes a while. I'm not seeing any. Again, remember, sometimes this can provoke dizziness and be very uncomfortable for the patient. After 30 seconds, I lift him back up, let him rest. Occasionally, you repeat it on the same side to to uh, uh, because one time I, I think um, oftentimes it takes once or twice to provoke the nystagmus. Again, the nystagmus on the affected side. Again, observe as Dr. Henderson supports the patient's head as he carefully lies him back, extending the patient's head 20 to 30 degrees past the edge of the bed. After the maneuver, he spends 20 to 30 seconds looking at the patient's eyes, observing for nystagmus either toward the side of the lesion or the more classically described rotatory nystagmus seen in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Here's an example of what rotatory nystagmus looks like. Again, you may have to wait 10 to 15 seconds after you finish the dix Hallpike maneuver before symptoms of nystagmus begin. So it's important to stay and look at your patient after performing the maneuver for at least 20 to 30 seconds. Here is an example of horizontal beating nystagmus. Remember, if you see this after the dix Hallpike, the beating will be towards the side of the peripheral lesion. So let's take a closer look with a calculator available on the McGee Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis website. From the drop-down menu, we choose ischemic stroke, a central cause, and a patient with vertigo. And note that the pretest probability is actually very high, nearly 70%. Maybe this patient had focal neurologic signs on their exam, cranial nerve deficits, aphasia, something like that. And we notice that they have trunchal ataxia, titubation when they're sitting there in front of us. Remember, that positive likelihood ratio was almost 18. So we move it up there and we see that now our post-test probability is virtually 100%. Time to get that patient to the CT scanner. But let's say that you're a little less certain. You know, the, the presentation is not quite so convincing and you're considering a peripheral cause. Well, then we change our pretest probability down to 30. Note that if they have trunchal ataxia, the post-test probability is still almost 90% suggesting a central cause. Let's say instead though you do your extraocular movement exam and find that they do not have psychotic pursuit. Well remember the negative likelihood ratio is 0.1 which takes your post-test probability down to almost nothing. So if they're able to smoothly follow your finger with their eyes without psychotic movements, a peripheral cause is much more likely than a central cause. Now a word on Dix Hallpike. So let's change our calculator from the ischemic stroke to central cause of vertigo over to sort of a blank calculator. Now, let's say that a patient comes in, we're not sure, we're about 50% certain that they have a peripheral cause of their vertigo based on their presenting symptoms and their history. So we do Dix Hallpike. And remember the positive likelihood ratio is 7.6. So if we have a positive test, then our post-test probability goes from 50 to 90%. So it's a very good test. It has a strong positive predictive value. A positive test makes it much more likely that this patient has a peripheral cause to their vertigo. But a negative test, it only has a negative likelihood ratio of about 0.6. So that only takes our surety from 50% to a little less than 40%. It's about a 12% difference. Not a lot. So a negative Dix Hallpike does not by any means rule out a peripheral cause for a patient's vertigo. I think that's something that is a good clinical pearl to remember. So to wrap up, let's talk about four take-home pearls from this video. The first is that history is paramount in discerning central causes of vertigo like stroke, seizure, mass lesion from peripheral causes. Recall that history alone, asking about things like periodicity of symptoms, associated hearing loss, etc., was enough to make the diagnosis without any physical exam in up to 75% of cases, according to some studies. Second, while cerebellar testing and gait observation is great for evaluating vertigo in general, the presence of truncal ataxia at rest while the patient's sitting or standing still called titubation strongly suggests a central etiology. Third, while nystagmus on your eye exam predicts vertigo in general, it's the absence of psychotic pursuit that favors a peripheral rather than a central cause and does so strongly with a negative likelihood ratio of 0.1, meaning that if there are saccades there, that's more likely to be something like a stroke, saccade, stroke, versus if they're able to follow your finger smoothly, that suggests more of a peripheral cause of vertigo.
Finally, if you're able to elicit your patient's symptoms of vertigo and observe nystagmus after performing the dix hall pike, that's strongly suggestive of a peripheral cause of vertigo with a positive likelihood ratio of around 8. But a negative dix hall pike is less useful in ruling out peripheral vertigo. And as Dr. Henderson said, this is a test you may have to perform one, two, or maybe even three times on each side in order to give your patient a chance to respond before saying that your patient definitely doesn't have a peripheral cause. Mm -hmm.